Hello, everyone, and welcome to Psychedelic Vantage. Today, we have the privilege of speaking with Dr. Deborah Mash, a professor emeritus of neurology and molecular and cellular pharmacology at the University of Miami School of Medicine. Dr. Mash is one of, if not the most, prominent Ibogaine researcher. Dr. Mash's work has played a crucial role in advancing the scientific knowledge of this psychedelic and its pharmacology. She has researched Ibogaine for over 30 years and was the first person to discover the active metabolite of Ibogaine, nor Ibogaine, amongst many other accomplishments. Dr. Mash is the founder and CEO of Demrex, a clinical stage pharmaceutical development company advancing Ibogaine and nor Ibogaine as therapies for addiction. Dr. Mash's knowledge, passion, and persistence is something that we at Psychedelic Vantage have always admired, and we couldn't be more excited to get this interview started. Uh, Dr. Mash, thank you so much for coming on the channel today. Thank you for inviting me. It's a privilege to talk with you today. You as well. Um, so, you know, we reached out to you to uh, see if we could discuss the recent paper published in Nature Medicine titled Magnesium Ibogaine Therapy in Veterans with Traumatic Brain Injuries. Can you tell us a bit about what was observed in the study and what stood out to you the most? So just to back up a little bit, I, I want to emphasize for the listeners that the publication in Nature Medicine, led by Nolan Williams and his team of investigators at Stanford University, is really a landmark for Ibogaine research. And not only for the field, but also emphasizes the importance for our military veterans. The main observations to be, to put it in a, if we put it in one sentence, is that military veterans with traumatic brain injury, and this would be blast injury, which occurred of course, in Afghanistan and Iraq, many people who came home from their military service with Operation Iraqi Freedom and Operation Enduring Freedom, many people experience these types of injuries during their service. And what this publication demonstrates is that they receive treatment, safe treatment with Ibogaine, and they experienced improvements in their overall disability ratings. Yes. Their psychiatric symptoms, but even perhaps more exciting was this very profound cognition enhancement. Hmm. And was there any neuroimaging study done um, for this study by any chance? Do you, um, yeah. That's an excellent question because many of us who have been following this research with the veteran community um, were waiting with uh, sort of uh, holding our breath to see the imaging data. But in this publication, it's uh, limited to uh, a sort of a, the what we call the psychometric data. So looking at okay. the disability scales, the rating scales, and the pre and post evaluations following the uh, those patients going first to be evaluated in the United States at the Academic Medical Center. And many of them I know were put in the scanner and there will be neuroimaging data that will, will follow in a subsequent publication. So we were a little bit, I think many of us in the scientific community were a little bit disappointed that we didn't get a glimpse or a glimmer of these profound changes that the Stanford team using state-of-the-art neuroimaging equipment and, and also data analytics and the algorithms have shown in public at some meetings and presentations from the group. But I guess uh, this is just a kind of the prolegomena to the next big, uh, you know, scientific breakthrough that they will show when mm. the actual functional imaging data are shared with the with the public and with the scientific community. That that's amazing. Uh one question here is what are some of the the general symptoms for for traumatic brain injury and what exactly is Ibogaine doing to address these symptoms? You know, that's a that's a really that's sort of the what will we call that? Uh the $150,000 question, <laughs> right? So 
to put it in simple terms, all right, to put it in simple terms, there are um, a number of different types of symptoms that people can have, right, from brain trauma, but they, these are the cognitive effects. So you can have um, changes in, in fine movements. You can have um, changes in word recall. Mm. You know, ability to do arithmetic, ability to concentrate, word finding errors. There's a host depending on where the injury occurs in the brain. So these functional, these are functional domains of the brain. And you will have differences if it's in the right hemisphere of the brain or the left hemisphere of the brain. Mm. The science has advanced, so that's that's the field of neuropsychology. So there are very well-defined exams that can be done. You can test, whether it's paper and pencil or, you know, on a computer, you can actually put patients in a neuropsych assessment. And then you can show those types of disabilities. And they will vary. You know, they'll vary based on severity and the, uh, the injuries loss of consciousness, for example, repeat injuries, but they're, they're functional impairments. And these functional impairments affect the quality of your life, your ability to, you know, to enter the workplace, your ability to deal with stress, your ability to problem solve, and decision-making. You know, again, depending on what parts of the brain are affected. And what can be worse also uh, with brain trauma is that many people who sustain brain trauma, whether it's a closed head injury or a stroke or a post-stroke neuropsych impairment, cognitive impairment is the depression. Mm. So you can imagine, um, and this can go on for a very long time. You know, you'll see that with people who have closed head injuries in a car accident. Hmm. That depression makes the quality of life bad. And what I began, we we've known this for a long time, and we were we demonstrated that in our own studies looking with uh, addicted patients who are breaking the cycle of, of their dependence to opioids, cocaine, or alcohol showed improvements in depression rating scores. So again, there are assessments that are validated, well-validated assessments that can be used to uh, you know, score up the severity of the depression. And Ibogaine definitely brings about is a rapid antidepressant efficacy that has been seen in open label, again, not demonstrated in you know, in clinical trials, the way you would need to do for the for a regulatory approval with the FDA or any other government agency, Health Canada, MHRA in the UK, wherever, you need to have that in a in a double blind setting. But but in open label uh, efficacy studies of IV, and this has been demonstrated over and over again, and mm. they demonstrate it again in their report here. So that depression is can be a sequelae of closed head injury or blast injury or traumatic brain injury. In some individuals, they may have suffered from depression before they ever went into the military, right? Okay. And so then the trauma, you know, can make things worse. Now yeah. add on the problem of the deployments in both of those veteran campaigns. They were difficult, right? And we've heard about this and the public has learned about this, that many of our men and women were in the field, multiple deployments, long time, put into very high stress, very high stressful situations. Saw a lot of action and, and sustained post-traumatic stress disorder after those deployments. They demonstrate here in this pivotal study that the participants showed benefit also for not only the, the 
traumatic brain injury measures, but also for the post-traumatic depression scores. So Dr. Mash, um, you know, as you mentioned, what was seen in this um, in the study was, you know, people, uh, the veterans, their disability rating went down, anxiety symptoms went down, PTSD symptoms went down. Um, I mean, so much seemed to be addressed here. And, and I would love to ask you this question, and I'm sure you've been asked it many times. Um, you know, how much of this is due to the onerophrenic effects of I began, you know, that dreamlike state. I've heard you in many interviews talk about how some people see a slideshow almost of their life. Um, and I want to know, yeah, how much do you think is due to these, you know, hallucinogenic effects? And I also ask this because in a, in an interview I heard with you a while ago, there was a point, I believe, where you took maybe a little time off from research you, you came back and decided, okay, we're going to develop neuroibogaine. It'll be easier that way. Um, and I believe your colleague said, no, you, you cannot forget ibogaine. You, that has, we have to bring that forward because um, the trip is very important. So I would, again, yeah, sorry, would like to ask you your thoughts on um, how important those effects are. Yeah, that's these are these are great questions and they're fundamental questions and they're they're questions that all of us in the scientific community and those who are working in clinical settings with the patients are asking themselves. Where's the science and what do we need to know? We as I sit here today, I believe that the that this is not one or the other, all right? Yeah. I think mm -hmm. that there are, if we look at the, the issue of neuroplasticity, why are we seeing these profound changes? Why is the study demonstrating these profound improvements in functioning, in brain functioning, as well as depression, at one month after dosing, yeah, something is healing the brain. Mm. These are these are functional changes, which means that there was the brain wasn't working well before the eye began, and then after the eye began, there's an improvement in the brain. Mm. Something fundamental changed in the brain. There was or what we would call the window of neuroplasticity is open. Mm. Many, many years ago, I did a, a fundraiser for Ibogaine, and this is really a long time ago. I actually honored one of the Bee Gees at this, and we were on Miami Beach. And our theme for the reason I bring it up in this context is that the theme for this fundraiser was healing the addicted brain healing inner wounds. Mm. The oneric effects of Ibogaine turn on neuroplasticity. They're part and parcel of the effect. You're engaging the brain, you're turning mm. on neural circuitry, you're turning on growth factors, you're turning on synaptic plasticity. The brain, you know, our brain, there are more neurons and neural connections in the brain than there are stars in the Milky Way galaxy. It's incredible. It is incredible. Yeah. <laughs> and the ability to repair the brain is remarkable. And mm. we are scratching the surface on this. We are scratching the surface on this, our understanding of this at the level of the synapse, at the level of the genes, of the neurotransmitter signaling pathways of the second messenger systems, you know, this whole cascade, how it occurs, what's going, we just, we're just beginning to understand that. But what we do know is that there's a certain class of compounds that do this. And they are the serotonergic psychedelics. Mm psilocybin, LSD, also MDMA, 
also ibogaine, ketamine, and noribogaine. Mm. So noribogaine is one of only a handful of drugs, one of only a handful of drugs that, that turns on this window of neuroplasticity. Dalex Pharmaceutical is studying next generation ibogaine analogs or azapenoindoles related to actually a composition of matter patent that we filed many, many years ago around novel analogs of ibogaine. Again, with this idea, do you need to have the trip to reach the destination? Is it the hallucinations? Is it the oniric effect? Is it the psychedelic effect that's engaging the brain in a way to turn on all these these windows of neuroplasticity. If you look at the fundamental work of a psychologist by the name of Dr. Um, Michael Mersinich, he published seminal papers. I'm, I'm a huge fan of his writings, but I like to quote him in my, in my research and I like to quote him in, in my presentations to the public that the patients who take Ibogaine experience a deep phase of cognitive introspection. Mm. They go deep. So after the visions stop, there is a cognitive phase of deep introspection. What's in the bloodstream during that phase is noribogaine. Ibogaine is rapidly cleared from the blood and then the noribogaine is reaching its max in blood. So the maximum level of noribogaine. So it's almost like a a two-stage rocket. You get the ibogaine effect first, you get active visions. When the noribogaine is high in the blood, the visions stop, and the patients report a deep phase of cognitive introspection, and the noribogaine is there. Mm. So we really can't disentangle whether how much of it is due to the visionary piece and the direct effect of ibogaine or the contribution of the noribogaine during the cognitive phase of deep introspection, or if it's both. We do not know. We simply Mm. do not know. But but maybe we don't even need to know. What we know is that the benefits are there and that the patients took the drug safely. One of the important findings in his publication is that this was safe. The drug was safe. There were no unexpected or serious adverse events for any of these patients. Mm. So Ibogaine was given safely in the setting and the patients benefited. And that demonstrates another important fact of this study is that the benefits outweighed the risk. Mm. Was Was the lack of adverse events due to the combination with magnesium or is there something more to it? Uh, from re- my read of the paper, I think there's uh, not there. My opinion, um, if I had a criticism in the paper, is that the, some of the details around the actual treatment of ibogaine are missing from this publication. I think there are some areas where we would like to have heard a little bit more, and that more details could have been given in the methods section. But again, keep in mind that the treatment was done out. Ex-US because we don't have clinical trials ongoing in the United States. So that's probably why there's there are fewer details. But back to your question is regarding magnesium. Magnesium was used in our trial, in our studies, okay. thank kids. Mm-hmm. We always had magnesium in the bag, and every patient, the IV lines went up and the fluids went up, and magnesium, grams of magnesium were administered prior to Ibogaine. That's common sense. Mm. If you know anything about cardiology and if you understand the uh, risk with a drug that is a QT prolonging drug, so anything that's going to change the rhythm of the heart, the electrical signal in the heart, you want to have magnesium. That's important. It's an, it's, it protects the heart. And so I think magnesium ibogaine is not novel. It Mm. was used in the clinical trials uh, by ATI in their clinical trials with ibogaine. And I certainly have lectured about 
telling all of the clinics who work outside the United States and uh, in Mexico, in the Caribbean and elsewhere, um, Canada, Europe, New Zealand, wherever, that magnesium is important. And you, you have to. I mean, you have to check patients' labs. You want to know that their potassium levels are normal. Are normal. You want to know their calcium levels are normal. And you want to know their magnesium levels are normal. But magnesium protects um, any time, uh, type of ectopy in the ventricles. So that's that's the one of the one of the risks for ibogaine is what we call ventricular ectopy, where you can have uh, an a, a serious adverse the event that could lead to ventricular fibr fibrillation, and indeed this has been uh, reported in the in the peer reviewed literature that this has occurred. So so Dr. Mash, with um, you know the the risks um on the heart that obviously we all believe can be uh, mitigated in a medical setting. Um, yes. I did, I did think about this a bit, you know, when people, a lot of people, um, when they've had a long history of addiction, um, you know, it's very possible that their heart and liver might not be in great conditions. Um, do you have a sense of what percentage of people would be eligible for this type of treatment in the future, let's say for opioid use disorder? Yeah, that's a great question. Thank you for asking it. So, this leads us to two words, risk mitigation, mm -hmm. all right? FDA talks about this. Any good, compassionate clinician knows about this. And when you're working with an investigational drug, which is what Ibogaine is, because it hasn't been approved for use, we have to be cognizant. We have to know, understand the limitations of Ibogaine as a therapy, and what are the risks? Exactly what you're asking me. You must have, you must be screened. So in other mm -hmm. words, some people carry a genetic risk. They may have long QT syndrome as part of a gene defect. Okay. That can be, that can be measured. Yeah. The doctor will see that. There are normal values for the QT interval, they're published, doctors know these. So when you have a cardiogram, if you have an abnormal cardiogram, the doctor will know that. If you have bradycardia, if your heart rate is way, way low. Now many athletes may have a low heart rate. And in fact, they do, runners do. You know, people who are really fit can have low heart rates. So again, the clinical exam is very, very important. We mentioned about the labs, the clinical chemistry. You want to know that your liver enzymes are normal. You don't want to be four times elevated or have liver disease. I can tell you that many people in St. Kitts came down who were hep hepatitis C, hep C positive. They were injectors. They were, you know, banging back a lot of, a lot of heroin. And they suffered from that, but they they were sick. Their livers were, were functioning. Okay. So their liver enzymes were in the normal range. So these are the, the types of risk mitigation assessments that must be done. Women have a longer QT interval than men. Mm. There are certain things that we want to check for women that may be a little different than men. And then, of course, understanding how to dose ibogaine. And I've talked about this many times in public about, you know, making sure that we understand the blood levels, what the blood levels of ibogaine and noribogaine are, so that you don't accidentally push someone into a toxic range of ibogaine. And people who take ibogaine in unsafe settings or take multiple doses or stack doses get in trouble. Yeah. But one of the major risks are that are are besides having a, you know an underlying risk, oh, another risk, drug drug interactions. I began undergoes complex pharmacokinetics. I published that paper in 1996, you know, um, as a an observation that we had when we looked at the liver enzyme that metabolizes I began to nor I began. And that's under genetic regulation. So it's you have fast, intermediate, and slow metabolizers or 
poor metabolizers. People who are poor metabolizers will convert less of the ibogaine to noribogaine. People who are mm -hmm. fast metabolizers will convert a lot of the ibogaine to noribogaine. And that's why the visionary period varies across wow. subjects. We could actually wow. look at the number of hours of, of visions, the, the slideshow, the oniric effects of ibogaine, the life review, for some people could be a few hours or they could be eight hours, mm. you see? And yeah. that had to do with, I could, I could actually phenotype the patients because we would do the genotyping. We would actually look at their enzyme, their liver profile in the blood. We could do that, isolate the DNA and genotype them. And we did that, but we did it retrospectively. So after a while, we understood that, you know, we understood that puzzle. And I could actually tell from the patients when, you know, they'd have the head, the headphones and the eye shields on. And you could, when they were coming out of the, of the visionary phase, you know, the, head, the eye shields would go up and they'd look around the room. And I said, okay, fast metabolizer, wow. okay, slow, you know, other people be in wow. the bed down for, you know, Elvis has left the building gone for many hours. So you could actually, the nurses could tell you. Wow. So it seems like uh, what you mentioned, just scratching the surface in regards to the potential of Ibogaine. Um, it, it's very exciting, at least when I read that paper, to see the effects it's having in regards to PTSD. Um, is uh, I know that Ibogaine is usually mentioned in regards to addiction, but is there so much more to this that, the the wider psychedelic audience or just uh community is missing in regards to the p therapeutic potential of ibogaine it's a great question you're uh, all of your questions have been are, are profound i mean they're the they're the fundamental questions that we in the in the psychedelic treatment therapy you know community and and part of this whole psychedelic renaissance are are you know scratching our heads and asking each other Again, the indication for use, all right? We know that sometimes you'll have a drug that you go through clinical development if, and you may have off-label use. I'm going to give you an example. Ozempic. Mm -hmm. Controlling your weight, improving your A1C values, Maybe it works for alcohol use disorder. Yep. I, I heard about that. That's pretty incredible. I, um, yeah. All right. Sorry. That's, a, the, that's observational data. Yeah. And we know data anecdote is not the plural of data, right? You got to demonstrate it in a study, in a well-designed study. But it's interesting. And it has to do with the idea of satiety. And like, I don't need another drink. All right. So... That's um, an interesting observation. In, in the case of if you're going to go in front of the FDA, for example, you, you have an indication for use and you have a clinical development plan that's building out the types of studies that the regulators need to evaluate for the primary efficacy endpoints. Hmm. Now we're hearing that I began, and of course, addiction goes back to the seminal work of a discovery of Howard Latsoff and the Underground Railroad of Addicts Helping Addicts way back in the, you know, 70s, 80s, 90s, right? 70s, 80s. When was I working? Early 90s when I went to Amsterdam to see this. Um, I've been at this so long, I'm losing track of time, <laughs> time and space, right? So the, there are a lot of benefits. And, and what's interesting here is that, you know, I think people come to addiction with a lot of underlying issues. What do I mean? Mm -hmm. Comorbidity. People are self-medicating. Yeah. They're self-medicating trauma, PTSD, depression, anxiety, social phobia. The list goes on. Yeah. Many of the patients that came through St. Kitts ex had PTSD, sexual mm -hmm. abuse, trauma. Mm -hmm. 
you know, death of, of their of their friends, overdose experiences, you know, seeing their friends die in their arms that they got off on drugs with, you know, all kinds of things like that. So it kind of goes with the territory and human beings are complicated. Some of us have resilience to drugs and alcohol. And many of these veterans, many of our veterans come back with what? Alcohol use disorder and drug addiction. So these are overlapping comorbidities. That's why it's so difficult to treat the disorders. The fact that Ibogaine has this benefit not only for the primary endpoint in this study, what, what is the primary endpoint in this study? Well, it wasn't it designed for that, but what, what the emphasis here is traumatic brain injury and PTSD, right? The depression and the anxiety ratings and the cognitive scores go, go all together with this, but it, it demonstrates that, the, again, I think the complexity of the human brain, cognition and intelligence. We're complicated. Mm. We're complicated. That's what makes us, you know, like the whales, <laughs> the ocean, right? We're, we're top predators. So, Even being sharks yeah. and whales, right? Yeah. Um, so, Dr. Mash, I'd like to, I've actually been uh, dying to ask you this question because um, I think it's important. Um, so, where uh, I'm actually, um, an intern right now at an intensive outpatient program. Um, the goal is to become a CADC, LCADC. And I've spoken, you know, I like to pick the brains of the counselors who've been working there for a while and they're aware of what's going on with research into psychedelic medicine. But, um, you know, when I ask someone their thoughts, a uh, counselor, and this person's a fantastic counselor, but the response I got back was, it's just another excuse for people to get high. So my question to you is, will it be, even if these, let's say Ibogaine shows very promising results in clinical trials, will there still need to be a lot of education on, on Ibogaine in the field of addiction and, you know, some of these um, beliefs that are held? That's a great question too. I know I've said these are great questions <laughs> every time you've asked me something here, but but that's another very important question. Yes, the answer is absolutely. There needs to be a lot of education about this. Yeah. The for those of us, seeing is believing. Yeah. Seeing is believing. When you've had the opportunity to work with patients, and in St. Kitts, for me, I think if I look back in my lifetime, I would say that the work we did there was definitely some of the best of my life because we saw the transformation occur in people. Mm. And these were people that had failed the standard of care. Yeah. These were people that were in, you know, had gone through multiple detoxes, multiple rehabs, addiction treatment, meetings, AA, NA, going in the rooms, you name it. Best mm. psychiatrists, mental health evals over and over again and nothing worked nothing worked and the fact that and we had therapists with us i had you know we had a ratio of four to one so there would be licensed u.s trained someone what like what you were you know planning to do in your lifetime mm -hmm. um, it, it you know licensed credentialed Therapists, yep, LCSWs, master's level, PhD, yep. et cetera, who were there with our psychiatry team. And we saw the before and after. Yeah. We were in residence and we saw the cognition enhancing that Nolan Williams and the team has demonstrated in their paper. We saw the patients tell us, I feel terrific. The fact that people didn't jump the fence and go out and get high, mm. the fact that people didn't go through severe withdrawals when they came mm -hmm. off of 100 milligrams of methadone, we saw it. Yeah. And that is why I have, I have fought for this and why I have not given up 
the trying to educate the public and to bring together the best minds in in the in the various communities. I mean, we need the leadership. We need stakeholders. We need more research. We need more research. We need mm. academic research. We need industry research. Yep. We need to have the types of studies which we had hoped to be able to launch in Kentucky with that $42 million, which yep. is off the table. And yep. the backlash is exactly what you're describing here. Yeah. Ibogaine is not a drug of abuse. We That's in my 2018 paper. We asked patients. We did structured elicitation narratives. And we asked them, you want to take Ibogaine again? And you know what they mostly said? Hell no. Brackets. Hell no. Yeah. That's what they told the interview. Yeah. Doctors and psychologists. No, no, I'm not, I'm not eager, eager to go back and do that again. I understand that people will abuse ketamine. Okay. All right. But if you look at the harm, if you look at the whole picture, the benefits of these drugs, this is transformative neuroscience. This is transformative psychiatry. Yeah. This is transformative addiction medicine. And what's exciting, when I, mean, I was in a neurology department, to have Nolan Williams and his team in one of the top-ranked departments in the United States come out and say that this drug has benefits. We turn the page. And I think many doctors and therapists, compassionate people, want to have more tools in the toolbox. Yep. Quite frankly, the medicines don't work. Mm. You know, some do and they work for a while and then maybe they stop working. And we see yeah. that with antidepressants. And mm. big pharma is not bringing on new medicines. They never develop medicines for the treatment of addiction. Yep. Never. It's too complicated. It's too messy. It's too risky. They want a blockbuster drug. Yeah. You know, and we understand that because developing meds and getting regulatory approval is very expensive. That's why Kentucky was so important because we could have had a Manhattan style project to go to really win the war on drugs. Mm. The same way that Oppenheimer and the best scientific minds came together and we were yeah. first. Why can't America be first? And, and take on this problem. The problem in our country today, the cost of society, addiction, mental health. Yeah. And people are suffering. It's disrupting families. It's affecting employers. And it's costing us as taxpayers. When do we stop the madness? The drugs keep coming into us. They yeah. come into our shores. We need more treatment, less punishment, yeah. And you you can you can try to interdict and and catch the DEA doesn't have enough manpower person power woman power to get there and find every drug that's coming in in the mail across the border on airplanes in suitcases come on come on so we need to have people make the cognitive plan you know neurons that fire together wire together. I don't want to get high on drugs anymore. Thank you very much. I don't need this. Now my brain is starting to go, I don't need this. I don't need this. And you know, as you begin to forge that plan and the cognition is there and you're working with the therapist, every day you're more resilient. Somebody comes around you who, who's got dope and they offer it to you, you go, no, I don't want it. Mm. I don't need that martini. I don't need that cigarette. I don't need that ne that next line of Coke. I don't need it. Yeah. It's, I mean, it's, I mean, the potential with Ibogaine, um, I'm very, I mean, I've always been fascinated with Ibogaine and 5-MeO-DMT. I'm paying a lot of attention to nowadays. And, um, you know, it's very frustrating to see that, you know, you, the thing with ha what happened with Kentucky and, um, and, my heart. You know, and, you know, just 
the fact that this hasn't been fast tracked yet. Um, like, and I know you, uh, I'd like to leave you off with one question. I know we're running low on time here. You, uh, I heard in interviews, you've spoken on the fact that, you know, some of the deaths that have been reported in, you know, non-controlled settings have actually caused the regulators to pause. I mean, how do you like tell them, like, listen, uh, it's different in a medical setting. Like, is, is that a conversation that you've had to, you know, have like, you know, I, I've said this uh, clinicians, we're, we've been working with the Thai life sciences. Yeah. We had the best, the world renowned cardiology team advisors, mm. experts, experts, ex FDA advice, you know, ex FDA employees, world renowned cardiologists who are the most distinguished in the field. And they all looked at the risks of Ibogaine. And I, I will say today that they all told us that you can develop this drug. Mm -hmm. The regulators, the people who work at the FDA, you know, other regulatory agencies in other countries, they understand. Okay. And they also understand that there are molecules that have been, there are drugs that have been approved for use which share some of the risks that mm -hmm. Ibogaine has. Ibogaine needs to be given under full medical monitor. They need the risk evaluation plan, but Ibogaine can be given it and can be given safely, just as reported in this publication, just as we reported in our St. Kitts cohort of 277 yep. people. And yep. if we look at, you know, what's happening now is that Ibogaine in my lifetime has since I got the original FDA permission to go forward in 1996 and couldn't fund the research, had the approval, the FDA was so collaborative and helpful and guided mm -hmm. us as academic investigators. We had permission to go forward. And this, this wakes me up in the middle of the night when I, you know, kind of bang myself in the head for saying, why didn't you finish that study, Deborah? Why, why, why? We didn't have the money. We didn't mm. have the money. We had the university. We had the team. We had the clinicians. We had the talent. We had the analytical assay. We had wonderful collaborators. So many people. So many people. But we didn't have the funding. And, and that's always been the barrier for Ibogaine. I, I really believe that the education that you're talking about is extremely important. But I know that many cl clinicians, many doctors... And therapists would want to have access to these tools. Absolutely. And we need to, we can regulate this. We can regulate this. This can be given in safe settings, whether it's Ibogaine or MDMA or psilocybin or a 5-MeO. Five, five Just like ketamine is being used today. Yep. We can do this. This can be done and we can, and we can see the benefits to the individual and to families. I hope you guys enjoyed that as much as I did. Uh, I want to thank both Deborah and Jake for participating. It was so much fun to be part of that conversation. Um, we've officially rebranded to Psychedelic Vantage. I hope you guys like the new name. I kind of dig it. I think it's great. Um, so we will no longer be, the, be Psychedelic Insights. So if you want to find us on Twitter, it's going to be Psyched Vantage. And we will have a website going live uh, within this week. We will know, We will keep you guys updated on Twitter as well. If you guys enjoyed this content and look forward to more stuff like this, please subscribe to the channel. It helps tremendously in terms of getting our videos out to a wider audience, which is what we, we, we'd like to do here. We want to reach as many as people as possible in order to just spread psychedelic awareness and psychedelic education. So... Thank you so much for being a part of the community. Thank you so much for watching and have a wonderful day, everyone.